Uh, good afternoon, and let me just acknowledge the presence of academician and the uh, father of Mango Induction Technology, Dr. Barba. And also one of our, my esteemed uh, professors, uh, Dr. Coronel. co-author in that book, uh, Dr. Namubo. Also wish to thank uh, Dr. Mon Rasad, former Dean of College of Forestry and President of the Agama Sigma Delta uh, Honor Society for inviting me to this uh, uh, lecture series and also for Chirka inviting me as well. Um, so, welcome to this seminar, my students. <laughs> and um, let me start with, sorry, with this uh, question. Do you know if we have a few round production of magnitude? Well, <laughs> I will not wait for your answer, but the answer is yes. Um, we have uh, for every quarter, and this is uh, um, January to March, and of course that is uh, October to uh, December, and we have basically a very good production on summer months, March, uh, April to June. So it's all here in the second quarter. But we do have some production third quarter coming mainly from the uh, other parts of the country. But uh, when we're talking about production, it's really coming mostly from Luzon, about uh, 57. So this is the harvesting calendar for mango by products in the north and central Luzon cluster. Uh, as you will note, uh, this is where the majority, the peak months uh, for Abra up to Tardak. It's basically March to May and a little bit of June in Isabella and Arubiscaria. For the rest of the months, they are Months. There are some production, but not a lot. And then, just uh, about November, December, because that is when the the uh, mangoes are at their most expensive because of the Christmas season and the past uh, New Year. So the, there will be a lot of demand for this. So they are producing at this time, but as you saw in the previous graph. Uh, only a very small production. And this shows you the uh, production in the Philippines. This is from uh, Bureau of uh, Agricultural Statistics. And the 100,000 metric tons levels can be found in this Ilocos provinces. So that is where most of the production is coming from. In this uh, very dry Regions. And of course, this green, there's also a lot, especially here in Sabela, Cagayan, there's still a sizable uh, level of production. And, and that's also occurring here in the uh, Sambuanga Peninsula and uh, here in Mani Pacquiao's province, uh, <laughs> Sarangani, uh, which is quite dry. And uh, so you can see that this region now is accounting for 28% of the production in the Philippines. Now, uh, Visayas, Cebu, Luido, Negros, um, that's about, accounts for 15%. No? And, but notably, there's no, or almost no production on the eastern side. Bicol, Samar, Linde, you know, those parts of Castle, because these are very rainy provinces. There's too much rain in those provinces. So uh, you would, 
the, the um, ideal site for bamboo production is those provinces facing the South China or now West Philippines. That's where you will find most of the production. For Mindoro, actually, this, this, this half that is really uh, the one with high production of mangoes. Okay, so what is the implication? We have year round production. <clears throat> well, uh, the mango processing plants can operate year round. Uh, and fresh mango will be available for more months of the year uh, for local and the export market. So the objective of my talk this afternoon is basically to produce more during the off-season in certain areas. It's not really the same Luzon that will provide or produce year-round, but really uh, probably distribute the production uh, instead of just March to May, uh, this can be distributed from December to June, at least half of the year. And then in other areas where they have different uh, um, weather patterns, then that is also the time they can actually have um, uh, also different time of production. So as you could see in the first graph I showed you, there is year-round production, in, but that's come from different provinces, not just in like logs. For Luzon, basically the season is uh, March to uh, May. Okay, uh, I'd just like to illustrate. Um, we've been to uh, this uh, Pro Foods International Corporation. And there, this is in Cebu, and it seems that the biggest plant there, it's, it's, uh, their site occupies 16 hectares. You know? And um, at the peak season, uh, their workers reach about 6,000. We went around and we were going around in a van, and the van was going inside the warehouse. So it's that big. And as you can see here, it can process 950 tons per day. That's a lot of mangoes. And uh, it uses only caramel mango. I was asking if they were interested in other varieties, and they said, no, uh, we're, we're fine with our caramel mango. So that's, that's the only uh, time we use it, the only variety we use. And uh, for the off months, um, after August, they process other foods. But they're operating basically year-round. So it's a very good, especially for Sherka, where there is a uh, focus on industrial, uh, an industrial focus for agriculture. This is a very good example. Uh, one of their um, newer products, Mango Nasleek, this is uh, passing through the IQF, or or the, um, uh, it's a new uh, processing, freezing, individually quick frozen product. And you can, this is frozen and you eat it, you put it on a microwave, and then it will be ready for eating. Mm -hmm. So that's one, and they have also this mango hat, so we can, we can um, export this mango hats again, uh, microwaveable, and they're frozen. So it, it um, <clears throat> bypasses some of the quality requirements. And you can see, this is as well uh, hassa and kosher, acceptable to the Jews, and halal to the Muslims. So they have a very good uh, certification system. And just to illustrate the processing that they have is a lot of because their main product is dried mango and uh, according to them our Philippine mango, caramel mango is the gold standard for uh, dried mangoes. So they're all uh, very hygienic and you can see they have invested quite a lot in equipment and this is a um, automatic bagging machine for the uh, dried fruits. Uh, um, so, 
and um, this is the range of products that they have. And so they use also some guava, banana, or the off season. So this is what we're trying to do if we can um, extend the mango season in certain areas uh, so that uh, we can have more mangoes during the rest of the year. But uh, they're actually doing well. Uh, they're getting uh, supplies from uh, Northern Luzon, Central Visayas, and as well as Israel. So it's a, a national population. Okay, so our question actually is how to program production. Okay. Um, so we have established that there is year-round production, but it is not programmed. It is programmed by the weather, the climate. But uh, for us, is there a way to be able to program production? Okay, so after about you know uh, several uh, maybe more than ten years of research, these are what I gathered uh, that uh, if you want. Um, flowering to be synchronized, uh, you have to start with the leaves. No? Uh, the leaves should be uh, synchronized in leaf production. Leaf flush production should be synchronized. So because the, the flower induction technology developed by uh, Dr. Barba, it's basically, you, know, you have to wait for the leaves to be seven to nine months old. Uh, they should be brittle when uh, crushed. So that is um, signified that it's ready for uh, flower induction. So until that is attained, then you cannot uh, spray with potassium nitrate. Okay, uh, different trees will also have different times of leaf flushing. So, and uh, this is basically for the mango growers. And it is a problem to synchronize mango production as much as 50% of the trees may not be available for uh, production during the current season. I was uh, helping a big farm in Pangasinan and um, they had 3,000 trees. But um, almost every year when we, when we uh, induce those trees, only about half uh, can be induced. The others are not ready, they're not ready. So what, what's the problem? Why can't we have 100%? Okay, so look at these trees. Um, there is a leaf flashing uh, here at behind. So you, you have only about one fourth of the tree having mature leaves. So when you spray this with potassium nitrate, only this part will flower. In this other tree, there will be a bigger area for flowering, but the rest will not be ready for flowering. And um, again, this one also in, you can see the big trees. And, and they have, this one is ready for flower induction, that one, but these ones are not. So that's why you cannot really program production if you have this kind of trees, uh, because the, you are at the mercy of nature. You cannot uh, have a chance to uh, modify them with technological intervention. But what can we do? So again, this one you could see it's the, the man is dwarfed by these trees. And that one is flowering. This one is there's a few flowers here. But that's about it. Okay, uh, just to show you uh, from our experience. So these are um, the off-season growers and very experienced, no? Very experienced. And they chose the trees, or these are the trees that are ready for flower induction. And so when we came back, uh, out of 336 trees, only 69, 69 produced leaf flashes or 21%. Those which flowered is about 48%. And there were others, 31%, just did not respond, they just sat there. So in effect, you have 52%. 31 plus 21, 
which did not flower using uh, the uh, technology. But this is, of course, uh, September. Remember, that's uh, off season. So we, we were looking at um, some answers. We were looking for some answers. And it seems that pruning is the one that is working to have a synchronized leaf production. And so that's why pruning is probably a regular operation to induce uh, leaf flushing in the US, because they have in, in uh, California, they have in, in Florida, as well as Hawaii, in Israel, in Thailand, South Africa, and now also China. We tried other methods like spraying of 3% potassium nitrate but, uh, and urea, but only about 50% efficacy. Um, but how can you prune? when you have very big trees. You know, it, it's basically very um, very dangerous and people don't want to do it because you saw the trees, now it's very big. Okay, so we, we think that I'm advocating actually small trees so that we can prune and aside from that, we can save on a lot of chemicals. You know, in mango production, you spend 65% of your production cost on chemicals. So if if uh, you can reduce the waste states of this, then uh, you will have you will gain more. If it very big trees, you have to make the spray very coarse so that it will reach the the, the 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 highest point. But if you have low trees, you can use a very fine mist, and you can have about 50% savings in, uh, in chemicals. Now this, the other one, bagging can be done very easily. Now there's no substitute to have flawless mango, but bagging can, is the only one you can really do it. If you spray with chemicals, yes, uh, you might have flawless, but it does not protect against um, the uh, wind scar, and a lot of the, uh, you know, the insects when they poo on the fruits, so they are stained. So you cannot, uh, it's only bad that will work against that. <coughs> and <coughs> as I will show later, you can actually have annual production instead of biennial. And this is very important, get good agricultural practice. This is a prerequisite for most of the um, export markets, they want to know that these mangoes are produced using good agricultural practice. But how can you have good agricultural practice if your sprayers uh, for the mangoes go up to the tree with their horses and spray while they are on the tree? So this is definitely not good agricultural practice. So we can only avoid that if we have small trees. Okay, so just to show some examples, these are uh, mechanically hedged trees in uh, South Africa. So there's a machine that goes uh, and cuts this. And then uh, uh, this was in Thailand. Uh, and uh, you can see it's about a bit higher, but not very big trees. And in China, uh, as you can see, it's really uh, very low trees. No? So I, I would like to um, show you some of the uh, reports of a couple of our colleagues who went to China. And this is the use before. That was the uh, mango in China. <laughs> now it's like that, uh, as you saw also in my picture. And basically, it's a small, uh, based on small trees. Um, by the way, this is a 
Florida variety. I think you win. And this accounts for 90%, uh, it means the small trees uh, production in Guangxi province, which is uh, this is about subtropical, about 23.5 degrees north of the equator. So the planting distance is 3 by 4 meters. And you can get 833 or 3 by 5. 667. So that is how they're doing it now. Uh, and it starts at uh, three years. You already have yield production and only spend at 50 to 60 fruits per tree. And at 250 grams per fruit, that translates to 8.34 or if it is 60 fruits 12.5 tons per hectare our present level of uh, uh, yield in the Philippines is about 5 tons per hectare of mango but then our spacing is very variable from 10, 8 by 8, 10 by 10, 12 by 12, 20 by 20 the whole range. And this is most productive on the 10th year, and, but could be they said productive up to 30 years because they've been doing this, it seems, for a long time. Already. Okay, um, so they, because of its small size, they tend to put some support, some uh, propping. Um, and Harvest is once a year. This is of course more labor intensive and requires regular pruning of branches to maintain productivity. And of course this is much easier to manage compared to tall and wild trees. So I think this is the main advantage. Okay, this is uh, of course a lot of you know well. Uh, our uh, assistant professor from uh, crop science. So he was there and it's about his height. And uh, this one thing I learned from the trip of his is that the height of the canopy, because this is a problem of mine, how, how high should you maintain the trees? So it says about 0.70 or 0.8 of the road distance. So example here, if it's your 5 meters between plants, uh, your height should be 3.54 meters high. Actually, it's still high. Um, but uh, their, since their row is about 3 meters, so their height is probably 2.5 or 2 meters. So here, here's the host there. Professor there, so it's illustrating. If you want to change the variety of this mango, you have to tapper and you cut it to his height, 1.2 to 1.5 meters. So that is uh, their uh, standard. It should be about man size, man height, and then a lot of people. Uh, can be employed uh, using for the top work, uh, top working for the uh, rest of the audience. This is basically changing the variety of your mangoes uh, or of any tree, changing the variety. So you retain the tree and you attach or you grab a new variety on top. And those are the these new, new ones, new shoots. And so you see, uh, after pruning, there's, those are the new shoots that will become the new variety. And so here uh, they have. So this one is, I think, a Florida variety that they wanted to, to use. Um, but uh, I'll assure you that the Florida variety does not taste good. 
But you could see that this is the result after the top working. So in less than a year, they could change their variety. Okay, um, there's a lot of other techniques shown for training and pruning, improve flowering, improve fruit set, and techniques to improve fruits and appearance. I'll show you a, a bit some of them. For example, to improve flowering, they use the Paclobutra. So actually, they they uh, manufacture a lot of this Paclobutra. So they, it's a soil dredge around the tree. And to improve appearance, they prune to remove the fruitless branches so that this will be exposed. That's the fruit. They remove this so this is exposed now to the sun. And here, again, removal of leaves. Again, remove some of these so that that's exposed. It's hiding behind. And they don't like twins, so they cut. They cut this one. I think there's a damage. So they, they also want to avoid the uh, abrasion damage. Uh, with the wind, these, these fruits would be uh, rubbing against, against each other, so there will be abrasion damage. So they remove that. Plus, if you want to get uh, good sized fruits, you have to thin out. You know. the, the bigger the fruit, the more expensive. I'm sure you are aware of that. So there's that, there will be uh, abrasion damage there. And of course, uh, this is, I think, uh, number one problem here is bagging. Uh, the fruit bagging will be much, much more uh, manageable here. So you will have a flawless mango. Okay, um, I think this is also one of the things that's very valuable there, that uh, at harvesting, there is simultaneous pruning at harvesting. So when you get this, cut it, and then you cut at the where it started. So this is the, this is the leaf flash. So you're basically um, cutting it back to its former um, size because the, the mango will expand uh, by shooting, uh, <clears throat> producing forth a shoot flash. And if you cut it at the where it started, you're back to um, the original size. Because uh, that is the problem here for our carabao mango. It will grow in size, grow and grow, and we do not prune it. So pretty soon they will be um, knocking at each other and there will be no more fruiting. And so now what they will have to do is to cut the trees in between and resulting in very big trees. But in this case, you can prevent that from happening. Okay. So far, um, we need small trees to be able to uh, prune. Uh, we can better manage uh, small trees. It can be high yield or even higher comparable to the big trees. And the, what I want to know is the annual, you know, because for the big trees, it's actually biennial production. But the question now is, can we accomplish the same that we saw in, for the carabao mango? Okay, um, this is what I've been trying to answer. <laughs> so, I have a proposal ready. We haven't uh, approved it yet. But uh, fortunately, I was able to talk to uh, one of my clients who put up a high density planting years back. So this is, by, this is about now uh, three years old in 2010. So this is a, a six by four, already a, um, a, that's about 400 trees per hectare. <coughs> and it was, it flowered in 2010, uh, naturally, because the, the owner did not want to 
induce it to flower because they, she thinks it's still very young, very small. Kawawa naman daw. Okay. So, but it flowered anyway, naturally. And so this is how it looks in 2011. And now they are inducing it to flower. And this one, from the natural flowering board, or produced 150 fruits in 2011. It looks um, really exhausted. So it, it's, it should not have been allowed to, to fruit that 150 fruits. No? But, uh, but what, what I would like to point out here is that these trees are capable of producing up to 150 fruits um, per year for carbon at this small size. And uh, looking at the estimated yield for that, if uh, your number of trees at uh, 4 by 6 is 400 trees per hectare, and your fruit weight that you're targeting is 300 grams, because I will show you the next slide, the range of carabao is, is very big, and your fruits ranges from 60 to 100 because you have these bigger trees. So you can get actually 7.2 to 12 metric tons, theoretical yield. Of course, we have to uh, show this on the ground. But um, look at this uh, Philippine size categories, uh, categories for the uh, Philippine mangoes. Philippine national standard, we have a Japan grade, a Hong Kong grade. The Hong Kong grade is the same as the Philippine national standard. But you can see that the, a tree will produce several sizes, super small, small, medium, the large. So I'm, I'm thinking if we could uh, look at this size grade and then the extra large. Uh, this would put, get you about 40 pesos per kilo, whereas the next size is minus 5, uh, so that's uh, 35, this would be 30 pesos per kilo. 25 and that's 20 pesos per kilo. So it's the same amount of kilos, but depending on the, the uh, size, it could be months, it could be double the, the price. So that's why if you have small trees, you can thin, you can target a size that is uh, more appropriate and more expensive. You know? So that is the beauty of having the small trees. So how to manipulate? Okay, well, of course, the climate is uh, paramount. Um, and then, but um, in type 1, it's still wet and dry. Well, that's about summertime, there will be flowering, no? um, December, everybody. And, but there are technological interventions which, if we put in a systematic manner, we can control the flowering and production. And these are all available now. It's a matter of putting all of this together and that's basically what I'm trying to do. Okay, so this is a scheme, basically. Uh, after pruning, maybe January to March, and this will be the one that will determine when you will produce, uh, when you prune. One month after that, there will be the flush emergence. Um, and then you will apply paclobutrazol, uh, a plant growth regulator. And four months later, uh, you can now spray potassium nitrate. And four months later, that flower will become a fruit ready for harvest. So these are all known. You know? um, and you could also prune there at harvest, or you could delay it by one month or two months, depending on the availability of water. Okay, so in Thailand, they've been doing this, that scheme is actually uh, from also done in Thailand. They were the ones who did it first in their variety, and uh, I just adapted it for Carabao, and they have this name, this Paclobutra, so they call it predict, because you can actually predict the uh, day of harvest. You can program. You know? And they said that they would not part with their paclobutrazol because it's so 
uh, ingrained in their uh, production system. Okay, uh, this is one of the researches I did and to show that um, when you add the pack with Vintasol, uh, in about after four months, 86% of the shoot sample had floral initials and they are now actually ready for flower bud break with uh, a number of agents, potassium nitrate, calcium nitrate. And you can get actually a very uh, uniform flowering and the whole canopy is covered with flowers. And so this, this actually shows that you can induce flowering in a programmable manner. So just to summarize, production can only be accomplished by synchronizing leaf flushing. So that always can be done by uh, pruning. And synchronized leaf flushing can be attained by pruning, of course. And this can only be done when we have small trees. And faster and program production can be realized with the aid of Paclobutrasol when we use the system. So using this system. And with that, uh, you can actually have year-round production. So thank you very much. I do have to ask any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Zagashno. At this point, I would like to invite our audience to use the microphones around the room to direct their questions or your comments to Dr. Pratasho. By the way, we will be uploading his video, which you can see we are taking now, as well as his uh, uh, the PDF version of Dr. Pratasho's PowerPoint presentation in the CIRCA website later this week. So if you wish to uh, look at it more closely and to uh, review, then you can get it from there. Any questions for Dr. Potasho? Questions or comments from our audience? Yes, Dr. Baraba. Okay. Uh, Year-round production implies that you can have uh, mangroves harvestable any time of the year, any month of the year. Can you do that? Uh, have fruits in January, February, March, April, from one or start until December. That's the same I have. Well, actually, you could do that if you're willing to spend uh, for fungicide during the rainy months. No? So you will be just, you will be um, actually producing every, or inducing every month. No? Assuming you can have the trees. You know, but that's still quite uh, hard to accomplish. But uh, depending on the site, you might be able to do it. If it's really very dry area and not so much rain, you can theoretically do that. Yes, no points. Marcy Xepo, Asherka. I've always been curious about plant production, especially with uh, forced flowering, put it that way. Wala hubang pagbabago sa size ng mangga. Hindi ho ba delikadong liliit ang mangga kung lagi siyang pinapoblaka? Para ba isang babaeng laging nananak, lumiliit yung anak? Para ganun. <laughs> I've always been curious about that question and I'm happy to ask now. <laughs> well, uh, you know, that, that's actually happening if the grower is not fertilizing. There's no fertilization because still um, a lot of people or growers do not fertilize. You know? But um, if you just supply all of the the fertilizer and then uh, that it should be okay. Um, and some of the trees also have that vanilla habit because they sort of rest. You know? um, so then they should be able to recover. But um, it's been shown that continuous production with potassium nitrate does not really result in smaller fish. Actually, if you have plus the foliar fertilizer, you can get a bigger proportion of the extra lights. Uh, 
fruits. So you see there's uh, extra large, small. If you don't fertilize, then you're stuck with the small. But, uh, so if you fertilize, then you have the bigger fruits. And irrigate. Irrigation is also important. Yes, Doctor. I would like to follow up on Dr. Barba's questions. With your presentation on uh, identity planting and use of Paclum Butrasol, I did not see how you can uh, program your mango production year-round. For example, if you have a hectare of 1,000 trees, and you, 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 you force all of these trees to flower, in one season. Where else would you get the other trees that will produce the fruits that you would like during the rest of the year? Well, um, at, at the outset, actually, I did not really say I'm going to present year-round production in one area. It was really more of year-round production for the country in other areas. But basically, it would be the um, it's really more of off-season to have uh, spread the production, let's say, instead of three months, uh, over uh, six months. You know? um, because it's actually very hard to, to program when you have the during the rainy months. It's, it's very tough. But as I've said, it is possible if, if um, but there will be less and you will have, of course, a lot more problem with the untracked nose. But um, to your question, if that's the, the question, just like in pineapple, uh, it, it, like when you have uh, 10,000 hectares, you will be apportioning, uh, let's say, um, several hectares for this month, the next month, uh, another one. So theoretically, you can do it. But um, economically, uh, I don't think it would be advisable. Why not? Why not? Um, because the cost of the control for the anthracnose is too expensive. So it, it's best to avoid it rather than uh, face it head on. That's the, the main problem. The question of uh, Dr. Marcos is that uh, in Candelaria, Candelaria is in Sariaya? Sariaya, yes. Theoretically, uh, what you are proposing is possible. But if we consider typhoon, this is the single most important climatic element, which we cannot uh, control. So any kind of intervention cannot, uh, cannot solve this problem. So. Uh, there is always a theoretical uh, possibility, but the actual way on how to do it because of this uh, limitation. Uh, yan ang problema natin sa year-round production ng mga uh, I agree, but maybe we can try it in Mindanao. <laughs> in the drier areas of like Samigadi, Jetsan. Okay, there was a question. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yes, yes, Dr. Barba, you first, so that we can finish. Uh, okay, Dr. Inesesita. Uh, you were saying that represent uh, urea or potassium nitrate is being used for strain as a force uh, uh, for flowering. Now, then you speak about good the cultural practices, I think this embodies the question of the greenhouse gas emission. I was just looking at the possibility that the UA spray, potassium nitrate, you are in fact increasing, you know, you are pumping nitrate into the air. And uh, under the present category of greenhouse gas, nitrate is 300 times more potent than methane gas, and methane gas is 20% more destructive and longer to you know, dissipate than carbon dioxide. So, <coughs> would that be a problem in the, in the long run? However, I would also like to take some credit. 
because I believe, I suppose that the commercial spray in the Philippines it started with the commercial availability of potassium nitrate. And I happened to register, you know, conduct the first commercial trial of potassium nitrate that made its registration here in the Philippines. For instance, I did the work for IFA fertilizer potassium nitrate in 1985-86, and it was registered in 1986. And then, because there was a big movement of potassium nitrate to raise, uh, I did not for tobacco paper. Then the other major potassium nitrate supplier in the world, which is the Chilean nitrate, also made some contact and I had to do the same work and had the same material commercially available in 1988. So, uh, in short, well, I have, I did the work for tobacco, but the biggest user really, the most beneficiaries really the uh, mango growers. But now, because of this question of potassium nitrate, uh, rather than not really potassium nitrate, but greenhouse gas emissions, I wonder if one day this will be a factor, you know, the forward-looking development of mango. The Philippines, which is, by the way, is a fraction as an exporter in the world, the biggest would be India, followed by Mexico, South Africa, and the others. Well, yeah, that, that's a um, an environmental question. Right? Uh, well, um, I think compared to the other users uh, or producers of greenhouse gas, we are very minuscule. Huh? I think we can afford to use. And uh, if not, uh, there's still another, there's still the uh, ethyl technology coming from the smudging. You can use the ethylene to induce bad break. It's not only potassium nitrate or calcium nitrate. There's in, in Thailand, they use uh, the diurea. You know? So there are a lot of flower bud break agents. Oh, yeah. By the way, I would just like to cut in because diarrhea is, I think, the bad is that an area which should be discussed a little bit. Yeah, I, I agree. It's uh, uh, suspected to be a uh, carcinogenic agent. Uh, but that's what they use in, in Thailand. They don't use uh, potassium nitrate. For some reason, I don't know why. Even with that uh, uh, suspicion that it is a carcinogen. Uh, Dr. Barber's question, that was a question. Yes, I joined there to the seasonality of mango. There is a similar impression that we can now produce mango the whole year round. But uh, it's easy to understand now we have mangoes. And sometimes we find mangoes. But uh, production wise, there are some technical problems. You can force the mango to flower any time of the year from the same orchard. But when it's in a typhoon area, uh, it becomes expensive. In Mira, Mahira, Pablo, Latin, cost of uh, the inputs from the side is very expensive. The tree does not flower as easily, so you have to spend more. And even the quality of the fruit is reduced, not, uh, not affecting, not including the diseases, and all, because a very high uh, water content uh, produces succulent and natural sweet fruit. That's why when they say, Mango from Pangasinan or Cebu are better. Uh, it's true to some ways because the climate is better. But we can still produce mangoes the whole year round and uh, in different parts of the Philippines. If we choose areas that have different uh, dry season, and there are many in Mindanao. Uh, we were in Bukidnon where uh, it's rainy on one side of the highway and the other side is dry. And they actually say that you can put on the other side uh, at different times of the year, as easily as you can at uh, different times of the year. So that's the possibility of producing uh, carabao members in the Philippines. Just the right timing and do it. Because uh, typhoon also destroys the mangoes. So maraming factors. So just to find the illusion that uh, we can produce mangoes, carabao, uh, the round from the same project. But the best way is to produce it in different areas where they respond to the growth. Uh, 
normally. And then again, thiourea is another one that can be used. The reason that Thailand probably uses thiourea is it's much, much more effective than potassium nitrate. And 25% urea will give the same uh, response as the 1 to 2 or 3% uh, potassium nitrate. And I must add that, uh, I mean add that both were discovered at the same time, thiourea and potassium nitrate. But potassium nitrate was introduced because it's it's cheaper, it's available. And uh, uh, yeah, I think that's a cheap benefit not to include the carcinogenic effect is was uh, non yeah. uh, that's uh, correct. The uh, when you produce during the rainy season it will not be as sweet as the uh, during the dry season because of lack of sun. Uh, let's have uh, Dr. Rosal first, and then Dr. Marisha. Um, not much of our mango production is exported, and it's the practice to export the better quality ones and consume the uh, low quality ones. Here. Well, about six percent, only six percent is exported, and yes, actually. Uh, it's just better quality in terms of it's flawless because they want uh, no stains, no uh, wind scar, but in terms of quality inside, it's, it's the same. But uh, that's the requirement of the uh, export. You know, they want always a, a flawless mango or a flawless banana. So it's about six percent. Doctor Marquez. Thank you for the nice presentation. But you started uh, talking about anthracnose and diseases. And you have not mentioned about uh, the problems associated uh, with mango production. And do you have some comparison about the diseases in insects during in juice and for the regular season flowering of mango? Oh, okay. Um, when you actually go for the off season, and off season meaning that it's like rainy, more rainy uh, in, in Busan, uh, you will have more of the diseases, no, but less of the uh, pests. No? But as you go more into the uh, regular uh, season, um, there will be less of the disease because there's no more rain, but more of the insect problems, insect pests. So it's uh, a trade-off. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tasio. You convinced me that uh, I will now talk more. <laughs> 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 okay. several, our, several of our members are higher than our, our, uh, the roofs of our houses, so we should. Now, uh, what do you think about the technology or practice of uh, bird edition, or having several root systems? And then rather, the old practice of burning smoke, what do you smoke burning uh, debris under the tree, the mango tree, to induce flowering? Uh, will, will, they, will, they, will not these two practices, practices hurt your technology? Well, actually, you know, burning is an age old practice, and uh, unfortunately, it's against the Clean Air Act now. And maybe your neighbors will be uh, <laughs> complaining. <laughs> but it works. Definitely it works. And uh, it also helps in driving away the insects. So there's actually organic production of mushrooms using just smoke, smudging. So they can drive away insects without using chemicals. So, but as I've said, venture against the clean air act. Now, about those uh, two uh, rootstocks. Um, we are, but we have no um, formal study from our observations. It seems that there is no advantage to having uh, two or three rootstocks to a to one plant. In fact, Kowango who did this on a very large scale uh, was saying, saying that uh, it's not, uh, they have no benefits from that practice. In some fruits, there is, but uh, rambutan seems okay, but uh, for mango, uh, there's no benefit. 
Okay, we have time for one more question. Yes, Dr. Gunanen. Uh, you may have to expand the Cheeto on your high density planting scheme for Carabao Mango. For, for by six meters distancing, how long will it take for the trees to close in? And do you need to remove some of the trees in between? Is this part of the scheme? Um, okay, that's a very good suggestion and I, I know I have to go to do more because uh, this is actually unfunded research. No? I just convinced the, one of my uh, clients to, to uh, try this. <laughs> we, we agreed on 400, 300, 200 and 100 trees, not, not for higher than that. So, but from now, we, I know or knew of this Chinese experience. I want to go really actually more into the 600 and maybe 500 uh, rings because they are smaller trees. And I think we have to go to the smaller trees because uh, even the one that we planted at 6x4, it's still tall. It's still be very difficult. So, um, this is ongoing and uh, all the initial efforts and we definitely have to go more into uh, detail for for this. Uh, this is just very initial efforts. Okay, thank you very much.